Um, I'm going to discuss the recovery trial, which is a large uh, randomized clinical trial um, studying possible treatments for COVID uh, here in the UK. I want to take us back to the beginning of March uh, when we were looking ahead uh, with some trepidation to what the uh, epidemic might, might hold for the UK. Uh, it was uh, clear from the information in Italy that for most people this was a self-limiting viral illness, but for patients at the sicker end of the spectrum, those who ended up in hospital, uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent would actually uh, not survive, and for those on ventilators that might be as high as 40 or 50 percent who died um, uh, in their hospital stay. Now, of course, the UK situation is uh, just one example of an international picture. And as I think we all see in the news, places like the USA, uh, Brazil, India, uh, Mexico have rising pandemics. Now, really, from, uh, for all of us uh, back in early March, uh, we could see a sort of unprecedented clinical challenge uh, the likelihood of an overstretched health uh, service with uh, worries about the availability of beds and staff and ventilators, huge time pressures and personal stress for those frontline NHS medical staff, and very large numbers of unwell, anxious, often elderly, and alone because of social distancing patients. Uh, and what was the major challenge was that we didn't know how to treat this disease. There are many, many possibilities, many uh, candidate drugs that people have suggested, and those continue to flood in. There have been many opinions from many sources, some of them extraordinarily high profile. I can think of at least three national presidents who have uh, um, endorsed or, or, or extolled the virtues of particular treatments. But frankly, until very, very recently, there has been no reliable data. There's, even the medical journals have had a few case reports or case series, um, but they have not been large randomized trials. And so we really haven't known how best to treat this disease. And so again, back in early March, our challenge was to think about how we were going to uh, sift through these possible drugs and uh, test those and understand which ones would actually make good treatments. And our rationale was we wanted to look for something uh, for things that were you know, had the possibility of actually having benefit based on data in um, the laboratory or in clinical data or in other related infections. We had to understand the safety issues, of course, and key, they actually had to be sufficient treatment available, not only for the trial itself, and we were going to plan to recruit several thousand people, but also so that if the treatment turned out to be effective, it could be rac rapidly scaled up as a treatment across the NHS and internationally. There's no point having a wonderful drug that is only available to a very small number of people, particularly in the context of a global pandemic. So the treatments we've studied to date, and I'll touch on some of these, and uh, uh, are really broadly in two classes. One is treatments directed against the virus, and the other is a set of treatments uh, directed to modify the body's immune response to the virus. And when one thinks about the disease, it's useful keeping in, in one's mind the idea that early on in the disease, the immune system is your friend. It's helping combat the virus. The viral load, the amount of virus in the, in the bloodstream is large, is high, and tackling the virus, it may well be key. But later on, the immune system actually starts to become not your friend, but actually almost hostile to you, leading to inflammation in the lungs, lung damage, and eventually respiratory failure, the need for ventilation, and then of course some patients sadly dying. So the treatments we studied were all readily available. Um, lopinavir ritonavir is a commonly used treatment uh, for HIV. It's been in use for um, many years now, widely available, for example, not only in the UK, but across Africa at low cost. Hydroxychloroquine, I think we've all heard about because of its, uh, uh, its high profile advocates widely used to treat malaria for several decades and some rheumatological conditions, but does it work in COVID? Convalescent plasma perhaps is a special case because of course it's not a drug. This is taking blood from patients who have survived uh, 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 an episode and recovered from an episode of coronavirus infection and using the plasma, the part that contains the antibodies as a treatment for patients who are currently suffering uh, from severe COVID. In some ways you could so sort of uh, naively think about it as a, an antibody transfusion or transplant, uh, and that, that is sort of how it works. Then there are immune system treatments, 
Low-dose dexamethasone, a, a commonly used steroid drug, we'll come back to that, azithromycin, which we normally think of as an antibiotic, but which actually seems to have some uh, anti-inflammatory properties, and tocilizumab, which is one of the very many uh, antibodies. Uh, these are manufactured and targeted against a particular pathway in the body's immune system. Um, very specific, very targeted, usually used in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So the trial itself, the, the key was to keep it simple. This is a pandemic. I've already you know, emphasized how the, the NHS itself, the doctors, the nurses, the patients are all under uh, extremely uh, stress and difficult circumstances. And so it's really important to keep the trial simple in order to generate the sort of information which will inform care. So we took actually patient, all patients who were admitted to hospital and had um, uh, the uh, viral infection. So you know, COVID is, is a, a disease that can affect anyone and therefore the trial was open to everyone, regardless of age or sex or, or location or other factors. Those patients were then randomized and there's a bit more detail than perhaps we need for today's discussion to either receiving no additional treatment on top of the usual care or one of each of these drugs uh, on top of all the usual care that patients would get as part of their NHS. So those are many of the drugs I've just shown on the previous page. And then you wait and you, fo and you follow those patients. And the key outcome for us was uh, survival or mortality, if you like, at 28 days, one month later. There are other in, uh, outcomes we're interested in, how long people stay in hospital, whether they need ventilators and one or two other things. But the key thing we all needed was to identify drugs that would actually reduce uh, the really quite high death rates, which I showed you very at the beginning. Patients could simultaneously be randomized to the convalescent plasma or control. So some patients could, could in theory get, for example, convalescent plasma and azithromycin. Some could get control and no additional treatment. The, the point is with all this is we didn't know when we were doing, these, uh, doing the trial whether any of these treatments were beneficial, harmful, or just plain useless. We have had a, a, an additional um, uh, step, um, which is for those patients who are uh, at the most extreme end of the, of the spectrum, the, the lungs are not working, low oxygen levels, and that there's a lot of inflammation, that for those patients, that was the place where we thought that the tocilizumab, the um, specific antibody targeting a particular part of the immune system might be helpful. And so those patients have been additionally randomized there. So what I want to do is think a little bit about uh, about the scale and the operation, because I think it's 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 helpful context. And, and, and I think it's reasonable to say that there is no other trial quite like this anywhere in the world. So uh, you can see on the left, uh, obviously, a map of the UK. Um, if you've got good eyesight, you can see that the furthest uh, north hospital is, is in the Western Isles, uh, up in the top left hand corner. Uh, we go down to Truro in the bottom left hand corner. Uh, from a number of places in Northern Ireland on, on the left and uh, across to Kings Lynn and others here in Norfolk um, are on the right. It really does uh, cover every, uh, every hospital uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the country that is dealing with acute uh, coronavirus cases. We set the trial up in record time. Um, uh, the first discussions of the trial were uh, uh, on the 9th and 10th of March. On the 10th of March, uh, Peter Horby, uh, my co-investigator, and I wrote the first draft of the protocol. It had been through all the approval processes, ethics, and uh, the uh, drug regu regulator, the MHRA, and so on. And the first site, Oxford, uh, was set up and enrolled its first patient on the 19th of March. Eight weeks and nine minutes later, we were actually randomized our 10,000th patient. And you can see that at, at some points, this is daily recruitment on the right-hand side, nearly 500 patients were entering in this trial every single day. Now, that rate of recruitment has tailed off. Why? Well, I think we all know the reason why. The social distancing measures have worked up till now, and the number of new cases being admitted into hospitals across the UK is currently at, uh, at much lower levels than it was uh, back around Easter. Uh, but of course, now, we're seeing outbreaks already in Leicester and elsewhere, and so uh, this trial continues to enrol patients. It con continues to be open for enrolment up and down the country. 
So as I say here, I want to now focus on what essentially is the first 100 days of the recovery trial. Uh, we went from our first protocol to first patient in uh, nine days. Uh, you can see that um, we reached uh, 10,000 patients uh, just at, uh, eight weeks later. Recruitment again has tailed off a little bit since then for the reasons I've just shown you. But this is a, a quite extraordinary rate, rate of, of recruitment. In the month of April alone, 8,000 patients were enrolled in the trial. That's about one in six of all patients who were admitted to hospital with coronavirus um, in the UK over the last two or three months. The lines towards the bottom and at the very bottom show the uh, recruitment into those other um, uh, components of the study I showed you in the sort of pale salmony pink, um, uh, the 772 patients are in the study of tocilizumab and at the very bottom the, in red are the 122 patients with the convalescent plasma. So what sort of patients were enrolled? Well, they were very typical of the sorts of patients that come into hospital in the, in the NHS up in, over the last few months. About two thirds were men. The mean age is in, is, uh, in the mid 60s, but actually 20% uh, of the patients were over 80 and a further 20% of the patients were between 70 and 80. Uh, different patients require different levels of respiratory support depending on how bad the lung condition is. And so when they were enrolled in the study, around a quarter of the patients, 25%, did not require any form of oxygen or ventilation. 62% required oxygen, uh, and then a further 13% required some form of, form of mechanical ventilation uh, or other intensive uh, respiratory support. Around a quarter of the patients had diabetes, a quarter had heart disease, a quarter had lung disease. Of course, many patients have multiple conditions. So just under two thirds had some other form of long term disease. And that's not a surprise, given the age and uh, uh, profile of the patients. The youngest patient, just for interest, was less than six months. The oldest patient is over 100 years. And uh, with regards to black, Asian and minority ethnic groups, uh, on the best data we have at the moment, around 15 or 17 percent of patients are from from those groups. And that, again, is very typical of the picture we see nationally over the last few months. So what do the data tell us? So I'm going to show you a number of graphs that look a little bit like the one on the left. And this is, if you like, uh, uh, imagining um, what happens to a group of patients who are all randomized, all included in the study on day zero. So different people's day zero is uh, a different date, of course, you know, some in May and some in March. But the point is you start everybody, the clock for everybody at the point in which they're enrolled in the study. And then the question is, up on the, um, the vertical axis, what percentage of those people uh, actually die? And on across the page, on what day um, since they were entered into the study do they die? And you can see that overall around 25% of the patients in the study have sadly died. That is just a reflection of how bad the disease is, particularly um, uh, how the bad it is among patients who are admitted to the NHS um, uh, over the last few months. If you look on the right, you can also see that, of course, that the risk of dying is higher in the elderly. It's a bit higher in men, and it's very definitely higher in those people who need more respiratory support. And none of that is a great surprise, but particularly with regards to the respiratory support, if the lungs are not working well at the beginning, uh, then the outlook is, is not as good as if their lungs are working well and people have uh, a less severe viral infection. And so here are the results. Here's the first result. So the first result is for hydroxychloroquine, which, um, as I say, is several presidents' favourite drug or was. And uh, what I've now shown is the same sort of graph on the left hand side. The black line, again, is the usual care. So this is uh, the standard care in the NHS. And the red line in this case is what happens if you get all that usual care and you get given hydroxychloroquine. And the answer is actually the risks of dying are no less, possibly slightly more, but actually statistically all one can say is no less than on usual, on usual care. So in this patient population, there's no good evidence that hydroxychloroquine is an effective treatment. And you can see that these results were achieved in extraordinary time uh, within 76 days of first um, uh, uh, studying the, this treatment. And that's had a global impact. So within, obviously covered by uh, the national media, I quite like this, this, this article simply because of the picture down in the left-hand corner. 
Um, but actually, within 10 days, the FDA, the drug, um, Food and Drug Administration in the US, who regulate drugs there, had withdrawn the license for hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for COVID. So we'd taken us 76 days to get an answer, which is record time, 10 days to get that implemented into practice, which until very recently, as I'll show you, was probably about record time. But then let's turn to dexamethasone, the low-dose steroid drug, which I think uh, many of you will have, have uh, read about recently. Um, and this uh, produced really quite different results. This showed really clear benefit amongst those people who are on oxygen and even clearer benefit on those patients who were on uh, mechanical ventilators um, uh, when they were enrolled in the study. And so here you can see, again, the usual care arm um, in black, 25% or so um, risk of uh, death in the oxygen only group. And if they then get dexamethasone, the steroid, in, as well as the usual care, that reduces to about 20%, a reduction of one fifth. It's not a cure, as I've said on many occasions, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great start. Now for the sicker patients, who are the people on ventilators, then on the right-hand side, you can see that the usual care, uh, they have, have uh, something like a 40% chance of, of dying um, uh, over the first uh, month or so, over the first 28 days. If they also get, in addition to the ventilator and all the other usual care, they get dexamethasone, then that risk is reduced by a third down to less than 30%. And so as I've uh, uh, said to, to others, actually, if you were to go on to a, uh, uh, an intensive care unit with eight patients with COVID and you were to give each of those patients uh, a, um, uh, a course of the dexamethasone, which, by the way, would have cost five pounds per patient, then you would actually uh, one of those patients would walk out alive simply because of what you have just done. And if we look at the results in more detail, so the results I've shown you are the bottom two panels on the left hand side. The upper two panels are showing the results overall, which is actually not terribly helpful, but particularly in the no oxygen group, the people whose lungs were working well, there the treatment does not seem to work. So this isn't a treatment for people uh, from your GP. It's not a treatment for a prophylaxis. It's not a treatment for patients who get into hospital and whose lungs work well, but it is a clearly a treatment for the patients whose lungs do not work well and need oxygen or ventilators. So I said that results to uh, implementation in 10 days was a record until recently. Well, this was, I think, the record breaker um, that we announced these results at lunchtime on the 16th of June. Uh, by tea time, the chief medical officers had written to every hospital in the country saying that this uh, should be uh, considered uh, as uh, a practice uh, changing um, uh, and adopted in the NHS. It's had international uh, uh, exposure so that the, w well, the World Health Organization have welcomed the results and are reviewing their guidelines. The National Institutes of Health, which is the, uh, the big um, health organization in the US, has also changed its guidelines as a consequence of these results. And so finally, we come to lapinavir ritonavir. Um, apart from the name being extraordinarily difficult to say, and so I think most people are pleased that they won't need to remember it, this, of course, was also um, uh, a negative result. This result came out just uh, yesterday. And you can see that there really is no difference whether patients get given the lapinavir or they get just given the usual care without the lapinavir. Either way, uh, the, the survival rates look exactly the same. And that, again, has had coverage. Uh, we haven't got to the regulatory approvals yet and so on. Uh, but there's the Daily Mail. Here's the New York Times. Here's the Hindu Times. So these results from the UK have had international impact. Now, this is a team effort. Here is a, a, about half of the Oxford team that have been running the study. Um, and uh, you know, enormous credit to them uh, for enormous efforts over the last three months in very difficult circumstances, as for all of us. But actually, also huge thanks from the team um, to all the patients all the doctors and the many others who have been involved in the study. We took a very deliberate approach to be as transparent as possible and communicate as much as we could throughout the study. So the study website, the, the address is at the top there, uh, includes information for patients. It includes information for staff, including the recruitment numbers, and it includes the results. And all of that actually is available to everyone. So you don't have to be a, a, a site staff in order to uh, read around 
the subject and look into more detail. This is a national project. project. Many, many organizations have contributed, whether that's through funding or whether that's through support or uh, helping us with uh, data. Um, but I think we should emphasize that this is the sort of thing that wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the long-term infrastructure support uh, through the National Institute for Health Research Biomedical Research Center and the specific grant that we got from the NIHR and the UK uh, Medical Research Council. And so my final slide is again to re reiterate, this is a national project like no other. There is nothing like this in the US. Uh, there really is nothing like this worldwide. In the first 100 days, it's changed three um, uh, approaches to treatment, uh, stopping two, the use of two ineffective drugs, but perhaps um, even more excitedly, finding the very first drug that actually reduces mortality. That's obviously an important result in its own, but it opens up the whole field for development of new treatments uh, over the coming weeks and months. And the recovery trial will continue over the course of this coming winter um, to, to make sure that we're able to evaluate all of those treatments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, yeah, I think we can all agree that it's it's hugely impressive what has been achieved in a short space of time and at such a challenging time. To, so thank you for, for taking the time today as well to, to talk us through all of this. We've had a few questions come in, so um, I'll get straight to those. Uh, Okay, so first of all, what can we learn from your experience in terms of adoption of clinical trials across multiple sites at scale and speed and effective trial management and communication? Well, I think um, when there's a crisis, it's a good time to innovate. And, and we certainly have found that um, uh, many people have been prepared to work together. So a lot of this has been about changing in, in attitudes uh, and collaboration and partnership. But certainly, uh, I think that uh, as, we, as we go forwards, there are issues around how quickly it takes to set up hospitals, 176 hospitals, what is actually necessary about training. Uh, doctors are, are, are trained to be doctors, pharmacists are trained to be pharmacists. What particular is special about a clinical trial? And our, very much our emphasis was on uh, that the, being involved in the trial for a patient or a doctor or anybody else needed to be as, as simple as possible and really as little extra effort by comparison with j just doing the routine NHS business as we could make it. Great, thank you. Um, someone has also asked um, about people who've been suffering recurring symptoms after recovery from COVID-19 and the long-term effects of COVID-19. Um, wondered if you've been involved in any research looking into that and treating long-term effects. Yes, I mean, the short answer is we haven't yet, um, but all of the patients that are in, in the recovery trial, we can co collect information over the coming weeks, months, and possibly even years to try and better understand that. Uh, of course, COVID is a new, a, a new disease. It didn't exist um, six months ago. Um, and so we are all learning. But you now this is a very you know, important uh, part of the issue. It's it, how patients feel, uh, but also um, how they function, but also how the whether there's long-term lung damage and and other uh, other issues. And there are many studies being set up just about now to try and understand that much better. It, it's an important area for for us to 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 really get to grips with. Absolutely, I suppose there's, there's still an awful lot to learn, as you say. Um, somebody asks, there's an inherent information challenge in running an adaptive trial where closing treatment arms will automatically provide both trialists and the public with some level of incomplete information about trial results. Um, so how have you approached this? Um, and did you have a plan for sort of communications from the start? Yeah, I mean, we've, as I said, our plan was to be as transparent as we possibly could. Um, so first of all, as an example, the protocol has been, uh, and every version of the protocol has been online yeah, publicly online, all the way through from the very beginning, the number of patients recruited, every submission we've made to regulatory agencies or ethics committees, all available online for everybody. Uh, the second thing is with regards specifically to results, then um, again, we've communicated whatever information we have as quickly as we can. In the context of a pandemic, then uh, where, where there are no drugs and there is actually no evidence base, then uh, the best we can do is to provide 
uh, clear information as rapidly as we can, even if it's not, that's not fully complete information. And to give you an example, um, uh, yesterday we um, uh, uh, closed down the recruitment arm for the lapinavir ritonavir, as I said, because it was clear that the treatment didn't work. Uh, now, we could have held on to that information and waited to publish a formal paper and so on and so forth. But the patients who are in the study, the doctors and nurses in the 176 hospitals, and by the way, there's about three and a half thousand of those people, would immediately want to know what's happening, quite rightly. And other, pa other doctors and other patients around the world will want, would at least be informed by the fact that uh, this particular study didn't show any clear benefit. Now, some people will change their practice on that basis, some want more information, but our job is to be as clear, as transparent and as consistent as we can so that other people can decide. But as I say, this up till very recently has been an evidence-free area of medicine because it's a new virus. Um, and uh, we've tried to get results out as quickly uh, and, as, and as clearly as we can. Um, uh, but in the context of, of an ongoing pandemic, you cannot wait for the perfect results. You know, if you look at the epidemic in the US or Mexico or Brazil, there are enormous numbers of patients being treated every day uh, on the basis of essentially um, often a hunch uh, or the recommendation of somebody senior, not necessarily on evidence. Great. Um, on, on the subject of, uh, of treatment in other countries, how would you say you've um, collaborated with researchers in other countries um, with regards to this trial? Um, well, we've certainly been very aware um, about other studies going on, for, for particularly the World Health Organization's Solidarity uh, Trial, um, uh, to make sure that we, where we are studying the same drugs, um, we, as soon as we have results, we share that we can share those. Also, where they are studying a drug, perhaps we're not. Uh, there's no point in us um, duplicating that effort. In terms of really informing the world of the results, we have made sure that we have informed regulators in Europe, in the US, um, UK, um, about the results as quickly as possible. We have informed the World Health Organization so they can be uh, transmitted as soon as possible. Um, uh, and uh, have uh, you know, tried to uh, raise awareness of the results uh, to the greatest extent we can. Absolutely. Um, and I think we'll just do one final question um, that was asked about the, the timings of treatment uh, for COVID-19. Um, uh, on average, nine days into the disease, is there, can you comment at all on that? Yes, I mean, on average, these patients were, one, were about two days since they'd been admitted to the hospital. I mean, obviously there's some variation around that. Um, so the first thing is that what we see with this disease is that the first week for many patients is a little bit like a bad viral infection, a really nasty dose of flu, and those patients don't get admitted to hospital. Now, there is a really open question about whether particular drugs might work in those earlier stages of the disease, um, but by the time people get to hospital, uh, they're no longer effective. And that's certainly plausible and needs more study, and there's a, there are other studies even being run from Oxford, the principal trial, for example, uh, exploring exactly that issue. Um, but we study the, patient, the types of patients that come into NHS hospitals, um, and they were very representative of the those types of patients. We get answers in that population. Um, as I say, one, one clear benefit with dexamethasone, um, which I think has really changed the way we think about this disease and the way we treat this disease and the outcomes for patients. 